Biologically, there are two main reasons why we need to eat. One of those is to get enough calories, enough energy to be able to maintain our bodily functions. The second is to provide us with essential nutrients. In this video, we're gonna focus on essential nutrients. Now, our bodies can make an enormous number of chemicals, ranging from sugars, to biological membranes, to bone, to skin. However, certain substances are required for our growth, metabolism, and transport. And some of these cannot be made by our endogenous metabolism. We just do not have the enzymes to be able to make some of these substances that we need. Therefore, these nutrients must be obtained from our diets, and therefore, these nutrients are considered essential nutrients. In this video, we're gonna talk about the difference between essential, conditionally essential, and dispensable nutrients. We'll talk about why vitamins, minerals, and essential macronutrients must be obtained in our diet. I'll ask you to be able to sort the relative approximate requirements of vitamins, trace minerals, major minerals, essential fatty acids, and essential amino acids. And by the end of this video, you should be able to classify nutrients as absolutely versus conditionally essential. Let's take a step back and talk about some of the history of vitamin deficiencies. To describe this, I'm gonna go through a disease called beriberi. Now you may not have heard of beriberi because it's quite uncommon right now. But with the onset of rice and wheat processing in the late 1800s, symptoms were noticed in some people, including weakness, cardiomyopathy, and speech difficulties, and vomiting. It turns out that's because part of the processing of rice was removing some of the husk or some of the shell. And inside of that husk, was an essential nutrient called thiamine. That's also known as vitamin B1. Once this was identified, we were able to add thiamine back into the food supply, often by supplementation or fortification of foods, and this has largely eradicated beriberi. This is true for a large number of vitamin and mineral deficiencies, where a certain population was described as being lacking of a particular nutrient, that nutrient was identified, and then supplemented or added back into the food supply, largely alleviating that disease. There are several types of essential nutrients. There's vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and some fatty acids. We're gonna go through each of these one by one. Starting with vitamins. Vitamins are defined as organic compounds that are essential for normal growth and required in very small quantities. This is distinct from macronutrients, which are generally required in larger quantities. Vitamins can be classified into two types. The fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K, and the water-soluble vitamins, the B vitamins, vitamin C, and choline. Next are salts and minerals. These are single atoms that our bodies cannot make. They can be excreted from our bodies through sweat, feces, and urine, and as they're excreted, we need to obtain them from our diet, again, because we cannot make atoms ourselves. Broadly, you can classify salts and minerals into two groups. The major minerals, which are important for osmotic balance, membrane potentials, and bone growth. This includes calcium, sodium, and potassium. These are required in quite large amounts. The second group are trace minerals. These generally support metabolism by acting as cofactors to help the function of enzymes. This includes iron, zinc, molybdenum, and selenium. These are required in much lower levels than the major minerals. The next class of essential nutrients are amino acids. Plants and yeast can make all 20 amino acids that go into protein, but humans and most mammals can only make 11 of those 20 amino acids. That means nine of those amino acids are required in our diet. The last class are fatty acids. There's two types of fatty acids that our bodies cannot make. These are known as omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. These are both polyunsaturated fatty acids, and again, since our bodies cannot make these lipids, they must be obtained in our diets. So how much of these do we need in relative terms? As I said before, vitamins are required in very small amounts, generally less than 15 milligrams per person per day for an adult woman. Minerals, especially the major minerals, are required in much larger amounts. For example, sodium and potassium, the recommendation is about 4.7 grams per day. The macronutrients, we require much, much more. So the amino acids and the lipids, we require up to 12 grams per day, depending on the amino acid or the lipid. For some people, some nutrients are essential only at some particular life stages or due to some particular factor. Here are two examples. Arginine is an essential amino acid. It's required in newborns, but it is not required in adults. The reason for this is our bodies have the biosynthetic machinery to make arginine from precursors. 
However, newborns require quite a lot of arginine because they're growing so rapidly. And the enzymatic machinery, even though it's present, is not sufficient to supply enough arginine to support normal growth. However, as we are adults and we grow less rapidly, the amount of arginine that we can make endogenously is sufficient. Therefore, arginine is required in newborns, but is not required in adults. Choline is another example. Choline, it turns out, is essential in about half of adults. This is largely explained by differences in both genetics and sex. Some people have very active forms of the enzyme that can make choline. For those people that can make choline endogenously, choline is not essential. However, if you have less active enzyme of this particular pathway, now you cannot make sufficient amounts of choline and therefore must obtain choline in your diet. The individual requirements for a given nutrient vary from person to person. To understand this right now, we look at population level averages. If you focus in at the blue part of this graph, this is showing the relationship of the risk of inadequacy of a particular nutrient relative to its level of intake. As the level of intake increases, your risk of inadequacy decreases. If you have absolutely no intake of the nutrient, you are at 100% risk of inadequacy. If we look right here, at this level of intake here, about 30% of people are at risk of inadequacy. That does not mean that any individual person will have an inadequate amount of that nutrient, but about 30% of the population. One of the goals of nutrition over the next few years is to come up with better, more precise estimates for an individual based on their genetics, their life stage, and their sex, among other factors, to be able to predict exactly how much of a particular nutrient is optimal for a particular person. In summary, there are several nutrients that we must obtain from our diet. There are several classifications of these, including vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and fatty acids. The relative amounts we need vary widely between the type of nutrient. Individuals also vary in the amount of a nutrient that is actually sufficient for their optimal health. We currently use population-based averages to describe how much of a nutrient is sufficient for that person.